Michael Burry was made famous by predicting the collapse of the US housing market in 2008 and 2009 and of course was eventually portrayed by Christian Bale in the movie The Big Short but what many people perhaps don't know quite as well is that that investment for Michael Burry was very unusual. The years leading up to the financial crisis, Michael Burry ran a concentrated deep value style fund, somewhat reminiscent of Warren Buffett's partnership in the 1950s or Joel Greenblatt's special situations fund in the 1980s and 90s. In fact, when Burry started the Scion Value Fund in 2000, he was actually approached by two different parties who were interested in taking an ownership stake in the management company associated with Scion, Scion Capital. And those two parties were one, Joel Greenblatt, who had actually stumbled across Michael Burry's blog with several really high quality stock write-ups and secondly a business called White Mountain Insurance Group. Now White Mountain Insurance Group was a public company run by a guy called Jack Byrne who uh, avid Buffett followers will know as the guy that turned around Geico and who Warren Buffett once called the Babe Ruth of insurance. And in 2001 not long after Joel Greenblatt and Jack Byrne consummated a deal with Scion, Warren Buffett actually took almost a 20% ownership stake in White Mountain Insurance Group. Uh, he paid about $300 million for that investment and sold it in around 2008 for more than $800 million. So in a very, very small way, Buffett himself was actually somewhat exposed to the performance of Scion Capital. Now recently I stumbled across some of Michael Burry's early letters to investors from 2000 to 2002, uh, a period of time where his returns were just spectacular and where he made his investment strategy crystal clear. This is going to be part one in a two-part series looking at some of the lessons and investment stories from Michael Burry in those early years of the Scion Value Fund. So if you enjoy this video and you haven't subscribed to the channel already be sure to hit that subscribe button but without further ado let's get straight into some of these lessons from an early Michael Burry. Now what is crystal clear in some of these early writings from Michael Burry is that he really had a very singular focus in terms of finding new investments for the fund and that was to have a singular focus on finding value the opportunities where he thought there was the biggest disconnect between the underlying intrinsic value of a given security and the market price at which he could accumulate stock in that particular company although Burry was lumped into this general category of hedge funds he really didn't hedge in the traditional sense and he felt that the best way to predict downside was simply to buy very very undervalued securities so here are a couple of quotes from Burry on that exact topic from some of these early letters. The best hedge is buying an appropriately safe and cheap stock. This is not the prevailing opinion however, hence according to a common interpretation of this fund's activities, the charter investors in the fund, myself included, entered November invested in a hedge fund that was by all convention completely unhedged. That's to say that Michael Burry didn't surround his core investments with shorts or options purely for the sake of trying to hedge volatility in the short term. He was really just focused on buying cheap stocks. He said, my strategy is entirely designed to avoid and otherwise minimize the price risk in individual securities. As a result, I would argue that it is the lack of loss in a month like November that represents the most reproducible and the most potent characteristic of the fund. Maximizing the upside means first and foremost minimizing the downside. The deleterious effects of permanent capital loss on portfolio returns cannot be overstated. And it goes without saying that a 33.3% loss requires a 50% gain just to attain break even. On the flip side, 33.5% saved on the buy price makes a 50% gain back to the price of the first consideration. On a percentage basis, and it is on this basis that we must evaluate each and every decision, lost dollars are simply harder to replace than gained dollars are to lose. Whether or not the fund ought to be called a hedge fund is an individual decision grounded only in semantics. Now Burry was also very hesitant to give any sort of broad market prediction. Instead he preferred to focus on individual companies, focusing on the micro over the macro and 
He viewed really the overall results of a particular index kind of irrelevant to his returns. Instead, his returns would be impacted by how good a job he did in analyzing a business's value and then buying at a steep discount to that value. Speaking on the broader market, he said, the prudent view, in my opinion, is no view. Rather, I prefer to look at specific investments within the inefficient parts of the market. I seek individual investments that will allow me to target total portfolio returns returns of at least 20% annually after fees and expenses on an annual basis over a period of years, not months. I do not view volatility as being in any manner a measure of risk and hence the fund is not managed to minimize volatility. And when it comes to finding value in the first place, uh, Burry will really look anywhere. And we saw that in the big short where Burry had investment banks literally go out and create a product specifically for him, a uh, credit default swap so that he could short housing. Uh, but more often than not in the early days, finding value tended to come in quite a liquid smaller cap stocks. The preference always would be to buy a long-term franchise at a substantial discount from growing intrinsic value. However, if one has been playing the buy and hold game with quality securities, one has been exposed to a substantial amount of market risk because the valuations placed on these securities have implied overly rosy scenarios prone to popular revision in times of more realistic expectation. The bulk of the opportunities remain in undervalued, smaller, more liquid situations that often represent average or slightly above average businesses. I will not label this fund a small cap fund, for this may not be where the best opportunities are next month or next year. As for the future, I can only say the fund will always be biased to where the value is. Now, the second thing that really jumped out to me in these letters is that Burry had uh, what's largely a very unconventional view when it comes to risk versus volatility. Now, uh, the typical kind of Wall Street view is that the more volatile a stock is, the more risky it is, kind of regardless of its underlying value. Michael Burry wholeheartedly disagrees with that and he actually shares a pretty funny story around that about a speech that he gave at a investment conference. A room of 200 wealthy potential clients heard me state unequivocally that risk is not defined by volatility, but rather by ill-conceived investment. The corollaries, as I pointed out, were that portfolio concentration and illiquidity do not define risk. That simple statement, I'm told, had not just a few of those in the room shaking their heads. The very pleasant gentleman who spoke after me proceeded to delineate how frequently his portfolio moved with a magnitude greater than 1% on a daily basis. I think the number was quite impressive for an institution that measures itself by such things, somewhere around 25 days in the past two years or so. And this he proclaimed minimized volatility and thus risk. He seemed a decent fellow, and if you wish me to provide his name and number, I'd be happy to do so. Not that he necessarily needs the business. Perhaps it's not surprising that your portfolio manager sat relatively alone at his lunch table, while the second fellow was quite popular. By and large, the wealthiest of the wealthy and their representatives have accepted that most managers are average, and the better ones are able to achieve average returns while exhibiting below average volatility. By this logic, however, a dollar selling for 50 cents one day, 60 cents the next day, and 40 cents the next somehow becomes worth less than a dollar selling for 50 cents all three days. I would argue that the ability to buy at 40 cents presents opportunity, not risk, and that the dollar is still worth a dollar. The stock market is full of dollars selling at much more than a dollar. A dollar that consistently sells at 1.1 times face value may even be respected for the consistency of this quality, earning it the right to have a premium. These are not the investments your portfolio manager chooses for the fund. A wildly fluctuating dollar selling for 40 or 50 or 60 cents will always remain more attractive and far less risky. Now on a couple of occasions through Burry's letters, he does actually share examples of just how cheap the stocks were that he was buying and some of the insane volatility and results uh, that he had, um, both when things worked poorly, but more often than not when things worked well. And this story that Burry shares about buying an unbelievably cheap stock on a free cash flow basis is uh, kind of mind blowing. And this story I'm about to share in particular was one that he actually wrote about over a couple of different 
different quarterly letters. Now, in the first quarterly letter, he said uh, the fund has been averaging down in a stock purchasing during the quarter, which has fallen tremendously out of favor over the past couple of months. Uh, he then went on to explain further, the future performance of this position will have absolutely no correlation with, with either the performance of the general market or further terrorist attacks. Now, we've got to bear in mind, uh, this letter was unfortunately written right around the time of 9-11, so that's what Michael Burry is referring to here. He says, at quarter end, however, the position sat at a low point, trading at a valuation of just three quarters the cash flow of the trailing 12 months. And unlike many businesses that have faded rapidly during 2001, the business achieved record-free cash flow yet again during the first half of 2001. I'll note that the prospects for recovery in this position during the fourth quarter are wholly in question. However, over the next year or two, and especially over the next five years, there's a very high probability of substantial gains as a result of this investment. Such gains would be largely irrespective of the status of any economic recovery or lack thereof. Now it turns out with that particular stock, uh, it did go in the direction that Burry anticipated, and it actually did end up happening exceptionally quickly. So this is what Burry had to say about that exact same stock in the very next quarter, uh, only three months later. As it turns out, we did not have to wait five years or even a year or two. The stock tripled off its quarter end lows by later October. Moreover, during early December, a competitor agreed to buy all the stock of the company at a price that amounts to nearly seven times its price as of September 30th, 2001. Indeed, while the stock traded down and around its lows, allowing the fund to take advantage of a truly tremendous sale of free cash flow, a secret bidding process was in the works. Two strategic buyers and one financial buyer submitted three separate bids for the company at valuations six to seven times the then current market price. This extraordinary example of market inefficiency surely increased the reported volatility of your investment in the fund, but without added risk, and ultimately much to your benefit. There are many in the investment world that believe the sentence you just read describes an impossibility. Not so coincidentally, both the CEO of the winning bidder and your portfolio manager independently responded to the same July event when finalizing our rather bullish investment theses, even as the market proceeded to punish the stock on the news of the very same event. Owing to our different professions, we went about our investments in different ways. I committed the fund to a substantial investment in the common stock. He called the target and began to bid for the entire company. You should recognize, however, that this is not such a coincidence precisely because I buy common stocks of the portfolio as if I were buying pieces of businesses. In fact, at all times, I strive to buy stock at prices per share that no acquirer would ever pay for the whole company, not because they're too high, but because the prices are so low that a potential acquirer proposing them would be laughed out of the boardroom. Such is the opportunity afforded by the very human nature of common stocks. So those are a few lessons that I really enjoyed reading about from some of these early Michael Burry leaders. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit like and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And keep an eye out for part two of this video where I go through some more lessons from the early fund letters from Michael Burry. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.